if you're scrolling through Facebook and all I see is like you as offer, you like, you know, another offer. Next time I go on, you and another offer, you know, there's not gonna be any sense of urgency and you're gonna be the offer guy, like, oh, he's just trying to sell me on this, you know, whatever challenge or this or that or whatever. But if I go on and every time I see you, it's like, hey, check out my free, you know, if, if you're in a hurry, if you're in a hurry in the morning, check out my free quick, you know, breakfast recipe or Hey, if you're traveling, here's a bodyweight workout for you to do. And, or, you know, you're just giving value and giving value. And they never see the offer unless they watch, you know, the free stuff, the contents, you know, that they're, you know, getting indoctrinated. And then the next time they go on, they're going to see your ad or see your offer. They're going to be like, oh, hey, that's the guy that gave me that cool tip about, you know, how to work out in a hotel or whatever. And then they're much going to be much more um, likely to buy or take you up on your offer compared to your competition, which is just beating them over the head with offers all the time. Welcome to the Viral by Design podcast with Dave Rothero, where we get inside the minds of today's leading viral marketers as they reveal the exact strategies they use to build brands, products, and campaigns that are magnetic to customers, spread like wildfire, and seize the attention of millions. This is Viral by Design. So welcome to another episode of Viral by Design. I'm super excited today about our guest. Jeff Sherman. Jeff's a highly sought after speaker and consultant on the topics of fitness and business development. He actually served in the US Air Force and after that launched his first business in 2001 at the age of 21. He's since launched five different businesses, including a multiple six figure generating Fitbody Bootcamp location. And this helped over 5,000 business industries to increase their lead gen and sales leverage and stuff like Facebook ads, Facebook page management, and also sales funnels to, to help them grow and to acquire new customers in 2017. He also founded New Move, which is a platform that turns books into interactive gamified community. So, Jeff, thanks so much for giving us some time today, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. So, dude, I, first thing I want to touch on is your military military career. So, obviously, you spent a few years in the Air Force there, and I've met a few entrepreneurs now, particularly successful ones, that have had experience in the military, both this side of the pond and also in the US. So, I'm curious to understand, like, what elements of what you learned in the military or how you developed as, as a person in the military you carried over into entrepreneurship and how, how you think maybe that helped you? No, for sure. I mean, obviously the military, you're going to learn discipline, right? So, and doing things that, that you don't necessarily want to do, but know that it's for the greater good of the, you know, of the mission or, or the cause. So, you know, discipline is going to get you pretty far. Um, for me, I was pretty lucky in the, um, when I was in the Air Force, I was able to become a personal trainer and do that as an extra duty assignment and develop that skill um, that was able to actually carry over once I got out of the military, you know, as well. So, but I, I would say just learning like structure, uh, discipline, um, just work, just work ethic, really. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I know, I know there's one bit of advice that um, like Jordan Peterson always always goes after, which is you re- you want to improve your life, start with tidying your room, and that always kind of feels like a like a really really great foundation point, like one thing that people can really grasp onto. What would you say is one thing that you could you could tell like maybe younger entrepreneurs or people are getting started like one discipline that they could learn um, which they could which you know they could apply every single day which could help them? Yeah, I mean I don't know necessarily if it's a discipline, but it's one thing that I struggled with in the beginning, and that's uh, asking for help. Like I always try to do everything on my own, and uh, that's going to slow you down more than anything. You know, all the information's out there. There's somebody that's done it. Um, you know, already. You know, don't be afraid to uh, to ask for help and to get the resources that you need to you know, move your business and, and your life forward as fast as possible. Yeah. So how does that like split like right now in your business? How, how does that uh, like manifest itself right now? What are your kind of day-to-day uh, priorities and responsibilities? Yeah. I mean, I'm fortunate at this point that I have a great team, you know, around me. So it's really just having the long-term vision for my company. And then I'm going to different events and I have different business coaches seeing what's working now and then teaching that to my team and letting them run with it. Um, and my main thing is just motivating my team and giving them permission to do their best, you know, and, uh, hire people that are much smarter and better than I am. Yeah. Right. How do you do that? Like, how do you motivate a team? Like, how do you pick out what's important to them and, and make them work harder while we can feel good about it? Yeah. So for me, it's really all about, you know, your business culture and what you want that to look like. I, vid- I visited the, uh, Google campus, I don't know, maybe like seven or eight years ago and, I found out like none of their engineers have like a work schedule. They can work as much or as little as they want. They can work on whatever projects they want. Um, they can hire who they need to hire. And um, so they really had a great lifestyle and everything on the campus was like provided for them from like five-star restaurants to laundry, dry cleaning, massage therapists, personal trainers. They never wanted to leave there. And in turn, that actually made them work like a hundred times harder. Now, obviously I couldn't you know, implement everything that Google does into my own business, but I took the things that I could and hired the people that were self-starters, self-motivated, 
that wanted a taste of what it'd be like to be an entrepreneur and the freedom, but also a little bit of a security knowing that the paycheck's coming as well. And you, when you hire the right people for your culture, for the right fit, then it just kind of takes off from there. And they're going to work 10 times harder, you know, for you because they know they're not just clocking in and clocking out. And, you know, by me not just be hiring like yes people and telling them what I want, and then they come to me for everything, I give them the creative freedom to, uh, to make my company better, make me look good, you know, in return. And you, when you give them a look, when you can let them take ownership in your company, uh, they're going to work, you know, 10 times harder for you. Yeah, 100%. Man. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that kind of premise. Like, I, I put him on here in, in the UK, um, who's working for Facebook. He took me, like, around the, the head offices in London this one time. And it's just crazy, man. It's like everything they want, like the barista. And obviously, yeah. they can't <laughs> afford to do that. But, but I love that message of being able to, like, that anybody can take that and, and instill that kind of sense of entrepreneurship in, into team members and into employees as well. I think it's such a such a great kind of message. Um, in terms of doing that, like, what's your what's your first of all, what's your process for hiring? Like, how do you? Because I mean, I, I'm also positive that you can find plenty of people in the world, and you throw them into that like Facebook or Google like environments, and they just sit there getting fat and playing video games all day, right? So, yeah. what's your hiring process to find people that really are going to resonate and that will will take that and run with it? Yeah, so for me, everything is, is results driven, you know. So if it takes them two hours to get the results that we're looking for, or if it takes them twenty hours to get the results we're looking for, the results is what is what we want. Um, so you really need to hire somebody that's a self starter and motivated by results, right? And, and not just clocking in and clocking out. And you're going to go through, you know, a lot of, you know, most people aren't used to that. Even my my best employee, my you know, my assistant, she she runs everything, and she was my first hire when I when I moved to California, like five years ago. And to be honest, like she's hired everybody since. So um, I, I give her that that freedom because she's going to be the one working with them um, more than me. Like I have the final say, obviously, but she goes and finds them. She vets them. She goes through you know first round of interviews. And if it's somebody that she wants to spend time with, somebody that she wants to work with, somebody that she believes has you know the work ethic, you know the self, you know being a self starter. And then I might just meet with them in a couple of minutes just to make sure that we click and and then we're good. Um, but I, I give her that freedom, you know, as well. And she hasn't made a bad hire yet. But yeah, I mean, if it's results driven, then if they're playing video games, you're not going to get the results. So they're not going to last very, you know, last very long. When you do hire like from corporate America, though, it's it's a big shock to people when there's, they feel like, uh, you know, they, they feel a little bit lost. So it takes a little bit of time for them to uh, to get used to, you know, not clocking in at nine and clocking out at five or whatever and having like what they're supposed to do exactly, you know, told you know to them. Um, but I'm a big believer in giving them the concept and then letting them run with it because I'm hiring, you know, I might be, I might not do a little bit of everything, but I'm not the best designer. You know, I'm not the best sales copywriter. I'm not the best, you know, marketer. So if I hire these people that have these creative talents, I don't want to put them in a box underneath me. I want them to be able to come back to me with a bigger idea. You know, like I said before, make me look good. And by doing that gives them ownership and motivates them you know, to work harder for you. Yeah. I love that, man. And, and I definitely have experienced that myself in my business where, you know, you bring somebody in that's not been in that kind of entrepreneurial environment before, and then gradually it dawns on them that they actually have the freedom to do what they love. And then suddenly one day it comes to you with this huge idea and it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, this kind of aha. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, for sure. So um, obviously you're like primarily in fitness and business development. So you've got like the, the Fit Body Bootcamp locations and um, you do the info marketing as well. So what would you say is, is different about growing a fitness specific business as opposed to something else? Yeah, well, actually I, I've sold all my fitness, um, all my fit body bootcamp locations probably like four, four, years, four and a half years ago when I first moved out to California, but I'm still heavily involved in the fitness industry. We have our agency fitness marketer where we help like um, boutique style brick and mortar gyms, cross stitch boot camps like that, grow and scale their businesses, you know, with, with online marketing. So when I was growing my, uh, my fitness business, you know, my offline fitness business, I, I also joined an online, you know, fitness mastermind where we did info products. And by learning all the internet marketing skills for my info product, and then applying those skills to my offline business, that's really what took my offline business like to the next level. And people started asking me like what I was doing. And that's how I kind of got into consulting and coaching, you know, personal trainers and bootcamp owners, CrossFit owners, stuff like that. Uh, because at the time, nobody was using online marketing strategies for their brick and mortar gyms. Now, every, you know, nowadays, everybody is doing that. But I mean, fitness is highly competitive. The good thing is that if you walk into a bar, you know, nine to nine and a half of people, if you ask like who wants to be in better shape is going to raise their hand. So your market is pretty much everyone. Um, so that's the good, that's the good thing. Um, it's uh, pandemic proof. As long as you find the right modality, obviously they couldn't come into the gym, but you could do it online. So we have people pivoting and, 
and just making more money online than they were in their brick and mortars. And a lot of them didn't even go back to their brick and mortars. They just, you know, shut it down and, and stayed online. And it's uh, recession proof. Like people know, like they need to feel good in order to work hard. So they're not the first ones to get laid off, you know, during a recession. So it's, you know, I built my, my Fit Body Bootcamp. It was in the, you know, we started in 2009, 2008 during a recession and, and we were able to build it. So that's one of the good things about the fitness industry is that everybody's always going to want to be healthier, always want to be fitter, stronger, um, no matter what's going on in the world. Yeah. So that's really interesting. You know, what you say about the, um, everybody's pretty much everybody's your market, right? Everybody wants to get fit, um, but it's a highly competitive market. So you've got this, this kind of great combination of huge market, but also, you know, decent, decent amount of competition. So in that kind of marketplace where there's obviously a lot of market saturation, how do you set yourself aside? What kind of messaging are you using uh, or are your clients using to, to attract people? Yeah. So, I mean, people can come in, they can, they can rip off your workouts, they can rip off your marketing, they can copy your ads, copy your offers. But the thing that you have, you know, is you, right? So it's, uh, you have to sell yourself, you have to sell your story, um, you know, tell your story and people are going to resonate with your story, resonate with you, your personality, with your view on the world and your view on health and fitness. And you really don't need you know, a big percentage of um, the market share to make a good living or make a good business, especially with smaller boutique style gyms. You know, in a city like when I, when I lived in Baltimore, um, it's like less than a million people in the city. And then the town that I was, you know, the suburb that I was in is probably a couple hundred thousand, right? And, um, you know, I only need 250 members, you know, to be making sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a month um, with like, you know, 50, 55% profit margin. So it's not a bad lifestyle business. And to get 250 people, it's like less than 1%, right? So, you, you only have to find 250 people that resonate with you. And you do that by sharing your, you know, what well, Gary B, you know, he says document rather than create content, doc, document what you're doing. People want to live vicariously through you. Just live an exciting life and document it ups and downs and be open and uh, vulnerable with people. And you're going to find your tribe, find the people that, you know, want to train with you. Any modality, whether it's high intensity training, you know, strength training, Pilates, you know, whatever it is. If you do it consistently, you're going to get in shape. So it's not, it doesn't really matter what the workout is, what equipment you have. It matters about you. That's the main yeah. thing. Yeah. So that's great. You're talking about documenting. You're talking about, you know, making, making life easier on yourself, making that content. So regards to when uh, you bring on a client, like a fitness client, what's the kind of like rough pathway that you take them through? Like what, what's the first thing you get them doing? Um, where do you kind of take them to, to, to success? Yeah, I mean, main thing is just really starting with the end in mind, seeing what their big vision is, and then working backwards from there. So we talk about like what I call like a vision goal. So um, you know, it's like the Dan Sullivan question, like what needs to happen at the end of this year for you to consider this year a success? And they say, well, I need this many, you know, clients. I need to make this much money. I want this many employees. So I take this many vacations or whatever. And they have this big vision. Then a vision without you know a process, you know, of, of attaining it is you know just like a dream, right? So you're not, you're not going to get there. So we kind of reverse engineer that and we're like, well, what needs to happen, you know, on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis and break it down even to a weekly basis. And then what do you need to do daily? So and how many, you know, leads do you need to get? How many appointments do you need to set? How many do you need to close to be on track to reach that goal? And they start implementing the process. We start, you know, documenting the results they're getting. And if the results are on track to reach that vision, then they're good. If not, then they kind of reevaluate. It's like, are you willing to do more, put in more effort and, and get back on track or, are you going to take that vision and be okay with like a little bit less or something different or, or whatnot? But it's all data driven, just like anything else. Uh, we start with the vision goals and then we work backwards and create the process goals. That's what works, right? Just the methodical approach, like figure out where you want to go and then step step backwards and, and build that build that path. That's awesome. So you, you obviously help people with uh, with Facebook ads, Facebook page management, and sales funnels as well. So it's all on the Facebook ads. That's something that's you know really interesting to us. So. What does that kind of process look like with people? Like how does your kind of Facebook ad strategy work? Yeah, I mean, I'm not heavily involved anymore. I used to run all my own Facebook ads like six, five, six years ago. Um, but um, it, it's, all, it's all the same thing. Um, you don't, you don't want to be like a me too, you know, offer a me too ad. So by putting out the content and then, you know, giving people value up front and for free and getting them to know, like, and trust you and resonate with you um, and then retargeting to an offer because, if you're scrolling through Facebook and all I see is like you as offer, you like, you know, another offer next time I go on you and another offer, you know, there's not gonna be any sense of urgency and you're going to be the offer guy. Like, Oh, he's just trying to sell me on this, you know, whatever challenge or this or that or whatever. But if I go on and every time I see you, it's like, Hey, check out my free, you know, if, if you're in a hurry, if you're in a hurry in the morning, check out my free quick, you know, breakfast recipe or, Hey, if you're traveling, here's a bodyweight workout for you to do. And, or, you know, you're just giving value and giving value. And, 
they never see the offer unless they watch, you know, the free stuff, the contents, you know, that they're, you know, getting indoctrinated. And then the next time they go on, they're going to see your ad or see your offer. They're going to be like, oh, hey, that's the guy that gave me that cool tip about, you know, how to work out in a hotel or whatever. And then they're much going to be much more um, likely to buy or take you up on your offer compared to your competition, which is just beating them over the head with offers all the time. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So I see you've got two big shiny two comic book awards behind you right there. Um, so which, which particular office of funnels, can you give us some background on, on how, you, how you got those? Yeah, so the one is for our agency, uh, Fitness Marketer. What we did is like, I already had about six or seven funnels that um, were converting in my own businesses. And what I did was just license them to other, you know, um, boot camps, other trainers, all of, pretty much all over the world. Um, because like, you know, somebody running an offer in Baltimore and somebody off running the same exact offer in Los Angeles, they're not competing. And we were able to, uh, to license you know, those funnels. So we had one funnel coming in, you know, to, uh, to get them on the phone where we would show them the different funnels that we could have that we could license them and sell to them. And then we build them out. And that was like the core offer of our agency initially. Um, and then the other thing, uh, the other one is with uh, my more of like the parent company, uh, Tech Sweat. Um, what we did is we started running like live workshops and uh, teaching people how to run their own Facebook ads. Uh, we called it like an implementation bootcamp where they would actually come to the workshop and by the time they left, they would have, you know, their ads up running, you know, live already making sales, you know, so yeah. that was, uh, that's what the other one was. That's awesome. So if you were to go back to, you know, when you founded your first business, when you were back in, um, back in 2000, right? When you, sorry, 2001, when you were 21 years old, um, if you were to go back now with the knowledge that you've got, but, but without the foresight of necessary, what was going to happen to you, you know, knowing what you do now and the wisdom that you've got now, what would you do the same? What would you do differently? What were the most powerful things and the things that maybe wasted your time? Yeah, I mean, I would do what I did in like 2008, 2009. <laughs> I would do it in 2001. Um, in 2001, I knew nothing about business or marketing. I was good at sales. I mean, I worked as at Valley Total Fitness at the time. I was one of their top salesmen. Um, but people were walking in the door, and I would stand at the front desk and you know ask them if they wanted you know somebody to walk around and show them what to do or whatever, and then close them on personal training. But um, when I started my own business, I was like, well, there, you know, there's nobody coming in. I would go out in the street and just talk to people because I was in an area where people would walk to lunch and stuff like that. So um, I would just hustle and, and get them in. But, if I were, you know, in 2009, once I started learning the power, you know, of networking and, and you know, affiliate marketing for online, took that, affiliate mar took that affiliate model to a brick and mortar. So I would find other businesses that had like-minded clients that they were serving in a non-competitive way. So for me, it's pretty much like parents. So I would go to the gymnastics center and I would work out some kind of deal with, uh, with the owners there where they would mail out to their parents, like a 21 day for $21 challenge. And I would donate 100% of that $21 to the gymnastics center so they could buy new equipment, they could buy uniforms, they could buy, you know, pay for different tournaments or competitions that their team was going to go in. So the parents could feel good about supporting, you know, the gymnastics center with, you know, it's better than, you know, doing a car wash or pumping gas or whatever, or standing on the corner with a five gallon bucket, you know, asking for change, you know, to, to, to raise money. So I would create like, a, you know, kind of like a fundraiser type, type deal and do these affiliate offers with local businesses. Um, and, you know, the first time I did that, um, I think I got like, I don't know, almost 50 people in at one time and closed like 27 of them to on long-term memberships. And I was like, it was totally free. So I would definitely, um, if you don't have, like you either have money or you have time. So I would spend my time developing those relationships with um, local businesses that serve the same clientele as you in a non-competing way. Yeah. I love that, man. And, you know, that concept of leveraging trust as well, I think is something which has so many different applications. Like, you know, early on, I kicked off in, in e-commerce. And one of the things that we leveraged was trusted platforms like Kickstarter, right? Being able to identify A, who's got that list, and B, who people already trust, so you can piggyback, piggyback off that. It's so powerful, right? Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah. So right now, in the, the situation that shall not be named and everything that's been going on this year, um, obviously, there's going to be a lot of people, like maybe uh, people who are in your situation coming out of the military, they've got all the, the determination and discipline and that kind of right mindset. And maybe people just feel lost, like you know what they thought they were going to do with their life has completely been thrown off tracks. They've got more time and they've got money, like you said. What would be your advice to somebody like that right now? What what would be you know the thing that you you tell them to to get doing get busy doing? Yeah, I mean to me it's all about skills. So I would develop a high income skill. Um, all the information in the world is out there. If you want to learn how to be a copywriter, if you want to learn to some kind of you know design or creating offers or strategy, um, and then I would find a mentor or somebody that's doing what you want to do, and um, you know go learn you know from them. Do research on their business and take the skill that you learn and go to them with like hey. I love what you're doing. Uh, I would love to, you know, 
I test out my skill with, you know, with, with your, you know, with your stuff totally for free. And if it works great, if not, no, no big deal. Cause a lot of people, they'll go to a mentor, you know, somebody, a potential mentor, and they'll be like, Hey, I would love to learn from you. You know, if there's anything you want me to do, just let me do it. You know, I'll do it for free. And it's like, they have to like, think of what, think of something for them to do. They're never going to do that. But if you go to them with an idea and something that you could actually implement, they're probably going to let you do it. You know? So if you go to them and be like, Hey, you, I love your stuff. Have you ever thought about doing this? I've done this with, with some other stuff and it worked great. I'd love to do it for you and just show you totally free. Most people aren't going to say no, <laughs> you yeah. know, and that'll give you a, you know, a foot in the door and a way to build that relationship and to start learning from them. And then what I would do is uh, start selling affiliate products, you know, in the industry or the niche that I want to eventually have a business in, because then, you know, um, you can start getting feedback and you can see like what's selling, what your audience is buying, uh, what they like about it, what they don't like about it. And then when you go to create your product, that's very similar to the one that you've been selling, you can take all the negative stuff that you've learned and eliminate it and then add all the things that people were saying were missing and have a much better chance of being successful with your own, with your first product. And you're also making money right off the bat. You don't have to worry about customer service. You don't have to worry about fulfillment. You don't have to worry about manufacturing. You don't have to worry about anything. You know, you just worry, just learn how to sell um, what it is that you want to sell. Um, and then you'll figure, you know, your customers will tell you what they want. It's great advice, man. Absolutely fantastic. So going into 2021 right now, what's your main priorities? What are you working on? What are you hoping to achieve by this time next year? Yeah, so I, you know, I've had my, my first venture outside of the fitness industry with, uh, with newmove.com. It's a reality gamification platform. All right now we're focusing on helping authors turn their books and, um, you know, into a reality game, helping course owners turn their courses into a reality game. And uh, with the pandemic, with most brick and mortar gyms closing down, it gave me the freedom, it gave me the time to uh, really just launch uh, my new software company. I've been working on it for like the last three, you know, last three years. But at, you know, with everything else going so well, it's, it's you know it hasn't been a priority. So now it now it is, and it's a pretty powerful platform. You know, with most course owners, most courses, paid courses, only about seventeen percent of the um, students, or whatever, finish the course. And for us, like when we were selling our high ticket items, like our masterminds and our events, stuff like that, we were selling those primarily to people that were going through our courses, our, you know, our two thousand dollar courses or whatever, because we were selling one fifteen twenty thousand dollar masterminds. And what we noticed was the ones that were actually signing up and coming were the ones that were finishing the course. So we wanted to figure out ways to get, you know, more engagement, get people through the course, because then we know we'd be able to sell our higher ticket item better. So we started looking at different aspects um, and community is, is huge. Nowadays, everybody is doing like a Facebook group with their course, right? So like you buy a course, it's like, oh, join our exclusive Facebook group or whatever. And they're getting a ton of engagement in the Facebook group, but everybody forgets about the course. So they're still only getting the 17%, you know, finishing. So what we did is we took all the elements of the Facebook group and put them inside the platform. So all the interaction now takes place around the course. So if when you finish a module, everybody can see it. It shows up in the timeline. People can comment and say, great job. Or they can, they can see what, you know, if you had, you know, whatever you learn in that module, you have to actually go out and do and then prove it through video. So everybody can see that you did it in the video. So everybody, you know, if you're funny, people are going to laugh like, Oh, that's great. Or whatever. And people, get, people get to know each other based on implementing what it is in the course, rather than just talking about theory and stuff in, in a Facebook group. That's awesome. And, and you know, I, I love the fact that you're leveraging that kind of that concept of accountability and the, the concept of community is so, so powerful, you know, especially in actually people get some results. So, if I'm a course creator or a book creator right now, or a book writer right now, author, maybe I should say, uh, then what's the kind of process for me to, to get my book and my course into this, uh, into this platform? Yeah, so if you already have a course, um, I mean, it's probably 70 to 80% done. Um, the difference between like a course, usually it's like step-by-step -step and, um, and they're just consuming the content. So really what you would want to do is break down the videos and the modules into actionable items so that way they can watch a little bit of content and then actually go do something and then prove it through a video or through a screenshot or something something like that to prove that they actually are starting to develop the skill before they move on you know to the next module they're going to earn points um they're going to earn we, we have the ability to, to implement uh e-commerce so they can earn like branded swags so it could be like a t-shirt it could be you know a water bottle or a journal or a pen or anything that you want a gold coin whatever whatever you want to uh give them as a prize for getting to a certain stage in the game. Um, they also can earn like virtual badges and stuff. You know, if they, uh, if they play for like seven days in a row, they can be like a bronze medal, you know, player. Four days in a row, there'll be a silver medal. And then 30 days, there can be a gold medal, you know, player. So they're getting that status as well. So we, we've imp implemented about six, seven different uh, gamification strategies to incentivize them to play consistently, to keep moving forward. 
to you know meet and interact with the other players uh, to collaborate you know with the other players and by doing all that we were able to go from a 17 percent um, completion rate to a 40 percent completion rate which is like 238 percent increase something like that something crazy and you're really creating this huge like interactive community that knows and likes each other and when you have events they're not just coming to see you they're coming to meet the other players because they already you know know them from inside the game and that's pretty powerful yeah that's huge man so just obviously i completely understand that you know and, and the power that it would have getting people to the end of the course and like having them enrolled in that, that community where you know there's there's multiple people networking around you as the authority you as the attractive character and just like increasing your your authority but in terms of like just getting people to that completion can you just give like our listeners an idea of what that means for your bottom line like how that actually increases the amount of money that you can get into your business Oh yeah, for sure. Like for us, like I was saying, like we use our courses to like indoctrinate and to kind of weed out who's a good fit for our high ticket stuff, right? So if you have like a high ticket item, if all you have is a course and then that's it, then yeah, your front end sales of the course is what you're going to focus on. You probably don't care if they finish, you know, or not. I mean, you should, but most people probably wouldn't. They're going to focus on front end sales. But we we actually create our courses as part of like a product suite um, because not everybody can afford a twenty five thousand dollar mastermind or fifteen thousand dollar you know workshop or whatever. So we still want to give those skills to people that, you know, are up and coming and because in the future, they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to be able to afford that. But for us, you know, when we were looking at uh, our sales of our high ticket items, we were noticing that, you know, seven, eight, sometimes even nine out of 10 were um, people that had finished a course were the ones that were buying, you know, our 15, $25,000 masterminds and stuff. So um, if we could increase the completion rate of the course, we were going to increase our high ticket sales. So it was huge for us. Going from 17% to 40 pretty much means we doubled, you know, our, our mastermind, um, which when you're talking about 50 people at, you know, 20 grand or whatever to 100 people, you know, it's pretty significant. Yeah, that's incredible. So we, we, where can people get involved with new moves? Why do they have to go to? Yeah, so like, so right now, since reality game education, most people don't have an idea what it is. Um, uh, we uh, we haven't sold it kind of we haven't sold it as a subscription base because most people even if they got it they wouldn't really know how to build it out stuff like that so we're actually like partnering you know with people authors like I said course owners and um, helping you actually build out the game maintain the game maintain the software add new features um, so the best thing to do is just go to newmove.com it's n u m o v e dot com and uh, just kind of check it out. See, uh, see what Reality Game Education is all about. We have a sample game on there. It's called the Perfect Week Challenge. Um, it's based around Craig Valentine's uh, Perfect Day Formula. Um, we pulled out some of his stuff and, and put it in there just to have like a sample so people would actually play and see what it looks like um, and get that user experience. And then uh, once you start playing that free game, you'll start um, you know, getting emails from me, obviously, and learning more about it. And then the opportunity will be there for us to you know, get on a call and, and just see if it's a good fit for us to work together. That's awesome. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for, uh, for giving us your time today. We'll make sure all those links are added alongside this episode. We really appreciate you uh, sh- sharing your wisdom with us, man. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This has been the Viral by Design podcast with Dave Rothero. For more viral marketing secrets and to get detailed cliff notes on all episodes, visit viralbydesign.net.